Hi, this is John Holmes. I'm the artistic director of the Nashville Opera. I welcome you to the second in our series of HBCU masterclasses. Um, we're going to have a, a really great session today discussing repertoire for singers, especially young singers, how they choose different repertoire. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking our project partners, Tennessee State University, Dr. Robert Elliott, head of music department, uh, uh, Fisk University, and the 105 Voices of History Choir, made up of singers from each one of the historically black colleges and universities in the nation. So these are our partners along with Nashville Opera in presenting this series of masterclasses. Uh, I also want to give a special thanks to our sponsors that have made these classes possible. I want to say thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts. Thank you to Opera America Innovation Grant and the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation. A special thank you to South Arts and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, and I want to say a special thank you to our project manager, Patrick Daly, who is here with us today. Um, so we have two wonderful teaching artists here. I want to do a short introduction of each one, and then we can get started. Um, our first teaching artist are, is Marquita Lister. Uh, Marquita Lister has earned worldwide praise for her great artistry. Critics all over the world raved about Marquita Lister's poignant, precise, and intelligent technique. With an impressive repertoire that includes the masterworks of Verdi, Strauss, Puccini, and Gershwin, among many others. Uh, Ms. Lister has sung with opera companies such as San Francisco Opera, Houston Grand Opera, Montreal Opera, the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, Salzburg, La Scala, Stuttgart, Deutsch Opera Berlin, uh, Opera Bastille Paris, and Michigan Opera Theater, just to name a few. She has performed with world-renowned artists, including Placido Domingo, Federica Van Schade, Simon Estes, Cheryl Mills, and Marcello Giordani. She is also renowned for her interpretation of the role of Bess in productions of Gershwin's Porgy and Bess all around the world. Ms. Lister received her Bachelor of Music degree from New England Conservatory of Music, where she graduated with distinction. She received, received her Master of Music degree in vocal performance from Oklahoma City University. And she is currently the coordinator of the Vocal Studies Program and Director of Opera at Morgan State University. So welcome, Marquita Lister. Thank you for being with us today. Yeah. Uh, our, our second teaching artist today is uh, Mr. Jason Ferrante. Uh, Jason Ferrante is an American tenor and voice teacher. He has been praised by Opera News with one of my favorite quotes, Jason, for singing up a stylish storm. I like the alliteration there. Um, <laughs> uh, he said, uh, Jason has great experience on the operatic stage in over 80 different roles. Uh, he also maintains uh, an acclaimed career. He maintains a acclaimed career as both a teacher, uh, a tenor, and a sought after voice teacher, becoming one of the leading voice teachers of professional singers. Uh, Jason's students sing around the world with opera companies such as Covent Garden, The Met, English National Opera, Santa Fe, San Francisco, Glimmerglass, and Wolf Trap, to name a few. Uh, his students have been winners and have been featured in the Metropolitan National Council auditions, the BBC Cardiff Singer of the World, and the George London Foundation Awards. Jason currently serves as a vocal consultant faculty member to the Young Artist Programs at Wolf Trap Opera, Minnesota Opera, Michigan Opera Theater, Nashville Opera, Kentucky Opera, Pensacola Opera, Arizona Opera, and Virginia Opera. Uh, the Baltimore native holds bachelor's and master of music degrees from the Juilliard School, where he held the Alice Tully Voice Scholarship and studied voice with the legendary vocal pedagogue, pedagogue Beverly Peck Johnson. Uh, Jason's additional studies were with Rita Shane, Phyllis Curtin, Cynthia Hoffman, and Richard Leach. Jason has written articles for the Juilliard Journal and has also been a panelist on the Metropolitan Opera Quiz. So please welcome Jason Ferrante. Okay. So, uh, so today, and thank you all also for being here to be a part of this. Uh, today, we're going to talk about repertoire and selecting repertoire and what may be right and what uh, auditioners may want to hear. And it's a, it's a hugely important topic. So uh, I want to start 
Um, and my first question, and if it's okay, Marquita, let us start with you as a, as a teacher with young students especially. Uh, uh, what, how do you go about compiling uh, an audition repertory sheet for students? Well, first of all, I think you should ask yourself these particular questions. Am I confident while singing the aria? Do I know it well? Do I understand the character and situation I am uh, portraying? Does it show the strengths of my voice, meaning the registers, the vocal colors, the word painting, and the declamation? Because the last thing you want to do is have an aria where you are showing the weaknesses of your voice and not the strengths of your voice, okay? Do not audition with a piece that is not well prepared. So I think it's very important for you to, first of all, consult with who I believe is your vocal best friend, and that's your teacher. Your teacher will clearly understand where your voice lies, particularly when you're young. You can have ideas about what it is that you like to sing, and you can prepare those things. But I think that you need those ears to really let you know where your voice lies in regard to the registers that are going to make you stand out and be special. And more importantly, you have to like the piece. If you don't like the piece, then you're not going to perform it well. I think that that's pretty much the way it is in any aspect of music. Very good. Uh, Jason, do you have anything uh, to speak on that? I want to say um, that P Professor Lister is absolutely correct. And um, going a little further even, to remember there's always a difference between making a list for a recital program and for an audition. One being fully a, a longer expression of, of who you are and what you feel, and the other being sort of a, a, a taste testing. And, and so the first thing I ask singers when they're making that list of things to audition with for grad school or young artist programs or for an opera company is, could I pick any one of those pieces from your list and just one without your input and have it be enough to show you off? And so if there is a throwaway piece on your list, you might consider throwing it away and replacing it with something that you would be happy with. And if, say, let's just make up a number and say there are five, everybody says they have their five now, um, that I could pick one out of the hat and it could win you a competition. That's a good starting point. And, and from there, understand that picking repertoire sometimes is like picking toppings on a pizza. Um, what, what John may like, uh, Professor Lister may not like, and that's just personal taste. But the good thing about singing for uh, people with experience is they know the difference between something they, they like the taste of and can, I don't like mushrooms on pizza, but I can acknowledge if they're good and if they're prepared well. And that requires your being able to show that off. But for me, the starting point is all, this is so voluntary. So everything that you offer should be, you should be proud to to sing and not not I can't tell you how many times you hear a singer say I hope they don't ask for such and such. Well, there's one way to make sure they don't, and that's make sure it's not on the list. Yeah. Very good. Uh, let me go ahead, uh, Patrick, uh, and open it up to some of the students if they have anything in particular uh, they would like to ask at this time, and, and then we'll talk about some other things as well. So does anybody have a question for our panelists? And again, help me, Patrick, because I can't see everybody, I think. Certainly, I'm looking through now. Uh, I think we're all trying to just getting adjusted because that was some really, really great information uh, and really great to look at. But if I could, as they're sort of getting their thoughts and their things together, sure. um, if I could ask, it was really interesting. Thank you, uh, Jason, for for bring, and both of you for bringing up those points. Looking at how to, so there were two questions that I kind of had when, when things that you both said. Um, one, going back to yours, Ms. Uh, Lister, you know, we talk about the five arias, right? And where you are currently. And I remember, and even still coming up as a young singer, um, everyone saying, okay, now these are the, these are your five, these are the main four that right now, you know, you can sing, you could go in and sing the role. But then there is a fifth one um, that is sometimes what people would refer to as a stretch aria. So I wanted to know what your thoughts were about um, a stretch aria being on there. So something that you may not 
quite be ready for, but their voice is leaning that way. Uh, and then there's another there's question another regarding, regarding sort of how, 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 how and somewhat some of some the little differences that would be between a young artist program or a company or some program audition repertoire list versus that for graduate or academic well, first, well, of, first all, of all, with my with students, my, 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 I have my undergraduate students, my graduate students, and I have my emerging artists. Okay, okay, so within so those three categories, we build not necessarily five areas. There are, of course, there are those basic five areas, but I also have those two extra areas. And then with my graduate students and my emerging artists, we also have the B list. The A list are those areas you sing the best on a good day. And that and B list are the Aries that you sing when you know you're not feeling well. 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 When you wake when you up in the morning, 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 morning you don't you quite have a B flat and a C the way you like. You're not going to pull out the piece that's going to sport all of those notes and sport the pianissimi and sport the marcato and sport the declamato. All those things that make everybody go, wow, that was phenomenal. But those B Aries are still beautiful enough and still show you off enough without taxing you in the same way. Okay, so if I have, so for example, I have a, a big voice soprano that sings the Papers aria, she sings Ile Dole Bon, she sings Rusalka, um, she sings Tosca, she sings all those things. She did very well in the Met auditions with those things. But however, when she went to New York, she didn't feel so well. So what do you do? Well, you go to the B list. Mm -hmm. And from that B list, you pull out your arias that you still know you can sing beautifully but maybe not have to tax your voice in the same way of singing those long, beautiful lines, really having to push the voice. And I don't mean push because I don't like that word because it's not healthy singing, but I should say, um, have your voice into the ultimate degree of what it can do. But just, you know, instead of pushing the metal all the way down on the car, you just kind of push it halfway so that you're not really having to go for it in the same kind of way. For my younger singers, we really, I really do encourage them sometimes to step a little bit outside of the comfort zone, but not in register, only in the amount of music they're learning in terms of how much they are going to have to pay attention to the dynamic markings, how much they have to pay attention to the translation, how much they have to pay attention to is there's maybe there's more than a fifth or an octave leap, something that's going to stretch them in their musicality. You know, I don't ever want my singer singing beyond what is comfortable. Now, that's a very interesting point because some singers are more developed than others. So if your voice is very mature at 18, you're not going to sing the repertoire as someone who's also 18, whose voice is not as mature. And now there are, you know, that's a big point among teachers because some teachers feel that it's kind of like a one size fits all. If you're 18, you should be singing this. If you're 20, you should be singing that. If you're 25... I don't believe in that. I believe that the voice God gave you is the voice God gave you. And we as teachers are to help to enhance that voice. If the person is not hurt, if the person is not straining, then why not? Give it a try. See what happens. You can always put it down and put it away when you become older. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you. That was, those are really, really great points because we all have to really keep in mind, you know, what is yours is yours and you have to be a good steward of what you have and sort of make those best decisions uh for yourself with your with the consultation with your team with your teacher so thank you for that Ms. Lister. and uh as i was asking again uh uh mr ferrante you know so basic things for what would be a difference or some basic differences in like a young artist program summer program those kind of auditions versus like a grad school audition repertoire list Right. So the, the grad school auditions tend to look to satisfy a few more uh, academic principles than, say, for a young artist program where you start getting into sometimes a singer. I, I can't tell you how often you hear, I don't have a German. Well, you know, I, Pavarotti didn't sing in German very often just because that wasn't his strength. And um, th one of the lovely things that happens when you're when you leave formal academia is that you can start informing your repertoire of, to be geared to your strengths just a little bit more right um of course until that's the time to really make part of your academic study 
be not just mastering high notes and floating and, and rhythm and, and fundamental piano skills, but the art of research and the art of investigation to be able to, to, to be a, a lyric mezzo soprano and, and understand some of those standard arias and that repertoire that go considerably higher than Mimi and the Countess, for example, but just because of rules of labels and fox, um, that's just the way it goes. But when you've done your research and you can cite that, that is one wonderful way to combat critics. And I am 150% in agreement with Professor Lister in when it comes to age and repertoire. Um, I would much rather have a young soprano try to, to lean into Visidarte at a young age if, if her voice is released when she sings that particular phrasing in E-flat major than having her struggle through Dove Sono, which can, you've seen, just knock women off their feet, even if, whether they're seasoned or not. And it requires a certain comfort level that with the knowledge of the repertoire that you can only gain through the investigation of studying entire scores, listening to music, being, being fluent that way. And um, that is, I felt like I studied a lot that way when I was in college. And I now looking back, I think I did maybe half as much as I could have. And I encourage you to consider adding even more investigation into your process now while you have those resources at your disposal every day. And one thing that, listen, I live to my, to my, my cell phone and my apps. I am, I, am, I am a social dilemma when it comes to, to my phone and I admit it. However, there are certain, much like athletics, there are certain skills acquired that you can't microwave. And you know, I could, you can, you can stand in the kitchen and, and cook dinner and look up the, a translation to a song in two minutes now, but there's nothing to say like absorbing it through investigation. And that goes for vocal technique as well. And I encourage you to embrace the act of investigation, even though you don't need to today, because the short version, the, the quick click, here's my translation, I'm ready for my lit class that I didn't prepare for, that, that will expire tomorrow. But I also add to that by saying that if you do the work that he's talking about, the memorization is easier. If you just go to IPA source, <laughs> or if you go to any of these other sources that are out there and you just write above, and let me tell you something, a little secret, not everything on IPA source is correct. So that means that if you have looked in the dictionary, yes, I said dictionary, and actually look the word up, look up the conjugation, understand what all of that means. When someone like me asks you, well, what does this mean? And then you going, well, it's kind of like, no. I mean, word for word, because then you understand the operative words, which shapes your phrasing beautifully. You're not giving emphasis to the incorrect language, meaning that then the grammar is incorrect. You want to sing with beautiful articulation because having sung in Italy and Germany and Spain, let me tell you something, those people love their language. They really do, just like we love our language. And so when you sing for them, they're going to understand that you don't understand. So if you make the time to do exactly what this professor is telling you to do, then you will get what you need. Thank you for that, both of you. Uh, we see a couple of questions and I wanna add like a small little comment to that. Also about the IPA thing. Even sometimes with the IPA, it, though it may even be correct of what's there, it may need to be modified for your instrument. That's right. It may need to be an open O because that's where it's going to sit on that line in the tessitura. So just so these things will shift. Um, but we have a couple of questions. I'm going to with I'm going to hear from uh, Khalil McCarthy. Hello, how are you? My question was dealing with IPA as well. When you're dealing with a new piece that has difficult articulation, what are some tips that you recommend to overcome those difficulties? Jason? Um, 
Hi, Khalil. Thank you for your question. And I still have my little list of, of, of uh, language traps that I have that I still have to work on more than others. Um, one thing before I give you my quick answer is to, to, when you have that list of things that you know you have to pay special attention to, it's often nice to keep that close to your chest and to your team, the people that you trust. And this way you can work on it without any self, without any, being self-conscious about it. And it, you won't take it personally that you need to work on it. Be very clear about what they are so you spot them in advance. So sometimes you tackle potential mistakes as opposed to correcting ones you've already put out there. But there are ways, and ask your diction teacher and ask your voice teacher for, I'm a little old fashioned with this, um, but to, to find, so tell yourself you have a goal. If, you, if rolling an R in the passaggio is something that's hard for you and you know you love text and that's something you want to do, you don't want to just get rid of your R, tell yourself your goal is to come up with three exercises that you know cultivates that and trust that regular commitment to it Will, will yield results. And it would be foolish if I went into the gym and expected abs tonight. And, but if you can commit to that sort of, but really be able to, to articulate, pun intended, what those exercises could be. And then you have a system that isn't personal. And I think we get hindered so often from facing our challenges when we take the having to do so personally. So we avoid it, I know I would. So when we can sort of make it an athletic sort of scientific basic thing that's just like, you know, cleaning up the restaurant after it closes, it's just a job, right? Then you stop taking it personally and you can absorb it. But be very specific, be able to say, I cannot roll my R, here are three things I am doing every day to work on it. And then the, even better is you can teach someone that in 20 years. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Great. Uh, uh, Marquita, do you have any comment on that as well? Yes, I absolutely agree with what, prof what Professor Ferrante, I love that name, Ferrante. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good when you say it. Ferrante, yes. <laughs> now yes, sing I, it. I, <laughs> I absolutely agree with what he had to say. You know, what's really tough is when we as teachers you're right out of high school and we're giving you art songs in foreign language and you've never had IPA. That's really, really tough. And I really understand that. And you haven't had diction yet. It's, it's not in your curriculum for your freshman or sophomore year. And now we're asking, now put the IPA over your every word in your song so that we know that. So then what happens is as teachers, we have to first break down one simple fact for you. And that is in the Italianate school of singing, there are only five vowels. That's A, E, E, O, and U, with the exception that the E vowel can either be closed, the E vowel can either be closed or open, and the O vowel can either be closed or open. And other than that, all you have to remember are those five vowels, which is why a lot of times everybody says, oh, I'm so sick of the 24 Italian songs, but that is wonderful training ground. And it's wonderful training ground because it gives you the repetition of how to sing those vowels aligned in your voice from the very top to the bottom registers. And I know that many times young singers don't understand how important that registral work is. It is like the cement that you're building your house on. So that all those great big giant pieces that you want to sing, you will be able to do like, like cutting butter because you really understand where the ah uh is in your voice, the e, eh, the e, and the oo, uh, where it is in your voice. Then when you transfer that open to more complicated languages like German and French, where there are more than five vowels for you to remember, you still have those initial important consonants. So then when you go from an open e to a closed e to a schwa, now we understand there's just a matter of the closing of the mouth, the lowering of the palates and all of that, which your teachers will get into with you. Okay, but you still have that firm foundation. So what I would say to you, Khalil, is embrace 
those vowels, those basic vowels. And as, as Professor Ferrante said, figure out how to roll. Because I know rolling R's is so hard for so many people. You know, when I, when I say, oh, I want a double R, I'm getting br, 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 br. And it's really understanding how to loosen up the tongue, loosen up those cheeks, loosen up the neck and all of that to help the, that tongue flutter the way that you need for it to, for the air to flow in the way for that R to roll in the manner in which you need for it to, okay? And then if it still doesn't work, you find a way to cheat. That's all I can say, but that will come along with your lessons, which is why I cannot state enough how important your lessons are. Committing to them, committing to what your teacher is trying to teach you and to help you become a stronger, intelligent singer. Because being intelligent is the most important part of it all. Understanding that this big thing in here, this brain, it is what guides everything that you do. And the more food you give it, the better singer you're going to be. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, Mr. Or Warner, I think you're next. Do you have a question? Um, so Professor Litzler definitely already answered one of my questions in relation to it was in relation to foreign languages, but it was specifically German, but I feel like she covered that pretty well. It's a focus on the vowels and then working from that. So um, my next question was actually in relation to what Mr. Ferrante said. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that all too well. Perfect. Um, <laughs> just right. as far as like um, <laughs> discover, um, looking into what works for you and like, I wanted to know what would be like, the first step towards that what would you, what would you say is the first step in the journey towards finding what works well for yourself that's a good question and thank you for liking my name just to give you a, a, a i grew up in east baltimore and everybody said ferranti so as soon as <laughs> as soon as i got into opera it became fancy <laughs> <laughs> whatever it's worth i've never rolled the r when i say it. anyway it sounds nice when you all do it though it's great um well i think the first step is that is to articulate clearly without any shame what the problem is and i mean and calling it a problem is all relative i mean none of this is in the constitution you cannot roll your r and you won't get in trouble right um but the fact that you care about it because you've chosen to be a singer means we have to treat it as if it is so I think the first step is in being specific in articulating what the problem is, looking at saying if you, we're using the rolled R as an example today, because that's an easy one, th to try over and over and try with someone you trust and ask them to show you, use your mirror, do whatever it takes, but say first, oh, here's what's not happening. So then you can choose exercises that, that fill in the pothole as opposed to decorating around it, right? Because there are, there are some traditional exercises for, for diction that might not address your particular problem. So it's, but it, for being able to say it out loud, it's not a personal fault. It's an athletic one. And when we say something is wrong, I think what we really mean is that it's incomplete. So, you know, you, you're a nice Mercedes Benz with three wheels. That's good, but it's incomplete, right? So I keep that in the back of your mind. You are not trying to go from bad to good but you're trying to be more complete and that this way you then you're forced to look at what's absolutely missing so i think the first step is to have a trusted professional on your team help you examine what's going on they have more experience probably in picking out some of the exercises this is where the the quick fix of the internet can be your friend you can go on youtube and find countless videos from from speech therapists and speech pathologists who know a lot more about those sort of um, therapeutic exercises than I do. You know, you have, we have, you know, Professor Lister and I have our fancy degrees in singing and voice, but I'm not a, personally a physician, right? And let that be, a, again, it goes back to investigating and, and researching, but being specific, when you know what the problem is, you will know what it is like to fix it. That's the best piece of advice I could, I could give you on that. Great. Um, Let's see, Miss Miss Hinton, you have your hand up. I, I, 
Ms. Hinton, I think you may still be muted. I, I'm not sure if I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. indeed. All right, all right, sorry about that. Uh, okay. I had a quick question that's kind of been on my mind throughout the pandemic. Um, uh, Professor Davey used the terms stretch arias. I have a few of those. So mm -hmm. throughout this time with the pandemic, us having this uh, access time to really go through pieces and get it in the body and things like that, um, I, I found myself kind of focused more on work and school and not really making as much time to consciously warm up every day and sing and things like that. So in making the conscious effort to um, go through like the dynamics and practicing diction and the dramas, the dramatics of the performance with the stretch arias during this pandemic, what are some things that I could be doing to still practice but not over sing because i know we probably shouldn't be singing the stretch arias full out every day because it could probably be damaging i'm not i'm not sure but what are some things that the professionals do you all to really you know get it in the body without over singing well i appreciate your question very much because i find that with the pandemic many of us are becoming lazy we just kind of, you know, we have our comfort food and we're not practicing as much as we should be and all of these things because you don't have your teacher there to say, are you practicing? You know, you get walking by their office every day and, and all of that. So my biggest suggestion is for you to fall in love with your voice. This is what I tell my singers all the time. You need to fall, you need to have a love affair with your voice. It's the only one you have. It's the gift that God's given you. So you need to nurture it. It's like referring to Professor Ferrante's um, analogy. It's like being an athlete. If you don't stretch before you do that mile run, you're going to get a cramp or you're going to tear something or you're going to injure something. So it's important that you vocalize every day. It's really important. It's more important than you can possibly imagine. Number one, it makes sure that you don't get any kind of a vocal injury because you may be over singing. That's number one, because you're, you're training the voice. That's what you're doing. Your vocalizations, that's your training ground. Okay, that's where you really work through the middle voice. You work through the mixed voice. You work through the head voice. You work through all the registers slowly. At the, at the tempo that is comfortable for you. And since we're all at home, you're not relying just on your vo voice lesson to do that. You have the whole day to do it. So let's say you wake up in the morning, you have your breakfast and you do whatever your routine is. And then you say, oh, I'm gonna warm up for 10 minutes, but have it be a healthy warm up, you know, where you're really gonna start slowly. Don't just initially just start full voice and with the most difficult thing you have. But the thing that is the least taxing and the most comfortable to rev up the engine, so to speak, to take on that bigger thing that you're talking about. And that way the voice is warm. You know, it's like nobody likes to get in a cold bathtub. Mm -hmm. So your voice doesn't want to start like that either. You know, you're basically giving an ice bath if you just wake up, oh, and it's okay, I'm ready. No, no, you need to thoroughly warm up. I always tell my students, you really should vocalize 15 to 20 minutes and that's with slow vocalization okay starting from the bottom working your way up to the top now I also suggest that you do your easier more comfortable music before you delve into the more difficult music vocally because you know why you'll love it more It'll be more fun, you'll feel more encouraged, you'll sing it well, and then it will give you the momentum then to delve into those more difficult pieces. Because now you've gotten these art songs out of the way, you've gotten your German out of the way, you've gotten your French, whatever it is you're working on. Now here I go to my stretch aria. Now with my stretch aria, I'm going to tear it apart. What is the most difficult part of that stretch aria? And I'm not gonna look at that most difficult part of the stretch aria until I know I'm really vocally warmed up. 
okay? And then I'm going to sing it well supported. I'm not gonna sit down in my chair and sing it. I'm going to stand up with proper posture and make sure that I am using my full support to sing these pieces so that I don't do what? Injure myself. So I don't strain, so I don't become hoarse. So my voice doesn't become raspy. And what is it about the stretch aria that is a challenge for you? Is it the tessitura? Is it how it's structured? What is it? I think the area, I think it's mostly the coloratura because it's so new to me. Oh, it's coloratura, one coloratura. of my favorite things. Now, the thing about coloratura is that we have so many fun, very fun. I say to my, my singers all the time, oh, it's coloratura time. This is going to be so much fun. And they look at me, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. No, no. And they all think I'm crazy. But here's the thing. Again, it's a part of your training ground. It doesn't have to be perfect. If you weren't born a coloratura, coloratura is going to be a little bit more complicated. You know, people have those natural coloratura voices. They can just sing and fly through it like it's nothing, okay? But if you're a lyric soprano, a lyric anything, mm -hmm. then if you're a little heavier, a little bit lighter, depending on what your voice is, it's going to take a little bit more. You have to understand you still have to sing with the voice. You can't sing off of your voice. You still have to sing with the breath. You know that the breath and the support are an old married couple. And when they're getting along well, you sing well, Okay. But if you have one or the other not quite doing what it's supposed to do, the voice is just not going to work for you the way you want it to. So with your teacher, I would talk about some vocalizations that you can work with slowly to build up that coloratura. Start slow and speed it up. But first start at what's comfortable for you. And then as you add the speed to it, it gets better and better and cleaner and cleaner. But really intending to, to be in the center of the pitch. You have to be in the center of the pitch. Otherwise, it sounds like indiscriminate pitch. It sounds just like a big slur as opposed to individually um, thought of pitches so that they're in a connection and they have line and fluidic question. I hope I did. <laughs> okay. You did, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think uh, Ms. Stone, uh, you had a question. You had your hand up. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, kind of shying away from like um, language and um, stuff like well, certain things like that. I kind of had a question about the length of pieces. So um, considering, um, you know, pieces, picking out pieces that showcase our voice. Is there such thing as a piece that is too long? Because I know the thing about uh, pieces being short, but are there things or anything against uh, pieces being too long or audition panels into either time length of a piece? Professor Ferrante? Yeah, I, um, I think what, when you're talking about an audition situation where you're on a, a grid, where you may know of a schedule that says, you know, 11.04, 11.17, right? And <laughs> understand what it is they want to hear. And frankly, if you start with O Quante Volte, for example, you may hear some beautiful, gorgeous singing. I'm a fan of the aria. Some people aren't, That's but that's pizza toppings, right? Um, but think about from go in knowing you want to show as much of yourself as possible. And that's, uh, so sometimes a, a piece that isn't too long, it's, it's not so much your opinion on long pieces versus short pieces, but about your opportunity. So I know if a soprano comes in and starts with Elvira's Afugio Traditor, which lasts about 90 seconds, I have plenty of time to hear more and then maybe a snippet of a third if I want. And that's just good strategy. But that's what an audition is, because that's not, that's not your, your own personal programmed concert, right? So from that standpoint, yes. Hopefully, I mean, to sip the tea here for a second, not everybody hearing you will be nuanced, but most people will see that you have parto parto on your list, and they may say, can we just hear the third section today? 
and they'll be savvy enough to do that for you. It's not your fault that the piece that suits you beautifully is long, right? Um, but I, I think the, the more you can choose repertoire for an audition setting that gives you the opportunity to show, to, to finish a piece and still see, oh, this person has seven more minutes, um, it's gonna end up working in your favor. And it also gives you a chance to sing again a little less nervous. The second piece is almost always better. And I find when, um, I, won't, I won't speak for Professor Lister, but if I do a master class, the singer's usually nervous first. And then we do a few things and they sing it again and it's better. And I somehow have tricked the audience into thinking I did magic, but really they were just less nervous, right? Um, so if you can give your spy yourself that opportunity to sing twice, that's, I think that's a good idea. So the short version of that long answer is that pieces that don't monopolize the entire audition with, especially those pieces tend, we see what we're going to see in the first two minutes. If there's four more, I'm looking at your resume or finishing notes from the last person or something, because you see what you're going to see, right? But grab me in the first 10 seconds, that's for sure. Don't, don't let me look away. Yeah. And so there may be a piece that is historically a more excellent piece of poetry and a piece of music, right? But if you have a piece that can grab me in the first 10 seconds and make me put my pen down and not look at the computer screen or any of that, I happen to love singing. So the chances are I'm going to watch you anyway, right? But that's, that's what I think we're looking for. Absolutely. Very good. Uh, looks like we have a couple of more. So we're going to hear from uh, Ms. Virgis, followed by Ms. Rainbow. Hey, everyone. Um, so I had a question that kind of was like um, Alicia's question, where, but in more of a musical theater aspect, like a song like I'm the Greatest Star, it's kind of long but it does have a lot of different things I feel like encompassing in that. So I feel like when you guys answered that last question, it helped me with this one as well. Um, and then I had one about what you guys said earlier about finding your strengths and all the different things that will help develop your voice. Where, where's the like line between when you're trying to develop your voice? Cause I know singers who are younger and singers who are just kind of getting into finding things on their own we have a tendency to copy what other singers do. So how can you still develop your voice without following someone else? I ask my singers not to listen to YouTube. As, I mean, I often tell them when you are exploring a piece, do it the old fashioned way. You know, when, when Professor Ferrante and I were coming along, there wasn't any YouTube. You know, there was only the card catalog at the library and you could go and look some things up and wait for the nice lady with the cart to come and bring you the books. And you kind of sit there and you look at them and you go to the copy machine with your little bag of quarters and you get your music and start all over again, you know, or you listen to records, you know, because we had records and we had, you know, uh, cassette tapes that we listened to. We didn't have all the fancy stuff that you guys have. You know, I think that it's important for you to understand that you are capable of creating wonderful characters on your own. You are capable of that. And the real recipe for that is number one, you have to ask yourself, who am I? Who am I in this piece? Who am I? What's going on? What happened before this particular moment? What's going to happen after this particular moment? Who's the antagonist? Who is the heroine? Who is the this? Who is the that? What time in history did this take place? You know, what, what was my, what's the librettist? What is the poet all about? What's their relationship with the composer? You know, it's really, it's the investigative process that Professor Ferrante has been talking about. It's fully engaging yourself in the process. And it, it is a process. And even after you've done all that work and you start singing it, then more questions come up. How can I make it deeper? How can I paint this word a little bit better than that word? How can I bring out the meaning, the emotional intent of it all? And as you mature and get older, the piece will change. It will. You can only bring to something what your emotional experience is. 
you know, and that's okay for where you are. That's part of the learning process. It's learning artistry. It's, it's learning what an artist is. And there is a big difference in a singer and an artist. An artist goes the extra mile to make sure that not only they understand it, but you, the audience, get it. Just by looking at it, you get what you're trying, the person is trying to say. Okay. I had a wonderful coach years ago who said to me, Marquita, I want you to split the audience in half. Half is blind and the other half is deaf. And if you can appeal to both halves while you're performing, you've done your job. Because we should be able to feel you, whether we can see you or not, whether we can hear you or not, just by what we see. Okay? That goes back to what I said before about having a love affair with your voice. This thing of singing, it's so wonderful. And it's so wonderful because you get to play all these people that you would be arrested for if it was in real life. <laughs> you get to play all these people <laughs> who have these incredible experiences and this rich texture of emotion. You get to, to play around with all of that in a safe environment. You know, and it's, it's almost like such a wonderful catharsis for yourself as well, because it's so releasing. It's so growth inducing as a human being. And as, and with you being young, take that and run with it. Understand it's okay to be artistic. It's okay. I agree. I agree. I was going to just add, if I could real quick, um, uh -huh. you know, the, listening to recordings especially of our idols and our great singers is such an essential thing and one of your jobs is to is to build a healthy relationship between your love of listening and the role that it plays in learning and those are two different things so i'm uh, in an ideal world i'm not with my earpiece in learning the music by listening to recording rewind 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 now, full disclosure, I don't want to sit here and lie to you on live TV. There have been times where I have crammed some things in my head that way. I have to admit it. I think it's important to know the people advising you are human, right? That said, coming, <laughs> to the, coming back to the recordings, once it is part of your bones and your opinion and your system to learn how did Seraphine conduct this? How did Kala sing this? How did Renee Fleming turn this phrase, right? That is that helps not only give you some new ideas, but in many ways it solidifies your choices as well. Turns out, wow, this great singer did it the way my instinct told me. Now I can believe in it myself. <clears throat> so to maybe not look at recordings as a way to learn. You know, going to Juilliard next door, all my years there was no longer existent Tower Records. And we all had a running joke where we said, if we were working on a piece and we hadn't prepared it well, we're like, oh, got to go to the Tower Records School of Music. That meant put your CD on and try to learn it really fast. I can't remember any of the pieces today that I learned that way. Um, sad to say. But let the recordings play an appropriate role in your investigation process. So, of course, you should listen. But I, I wholeheartedly agree with Professor Lister that, that it should not be the starting point. Because by nature, then you're coming out of the gates with someone else's stamp and not your own. And then you'll find over the years, your stamp gets stronger and there's a lot more ink on it when you learn more and it means something. And then you find all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're Professor Lister and I, and there are people asking you to help them with their stamp. And you're like, well, when did that happen? <laughs> right? And that's because you took the time to do it. And I hope if you're listening to this today, that you teach people. It is so in part of our future. It's, it's, it's bigger than, than I mean, I, you know, I know I'm saying this with the head of an opera company in the room, but it's bigger than fundraising. It is passing on, it is passing on the importance of it and, and the value of it and, and trusting just because I know something doesn't mean someone two generations from me doesn't and doesn't want to. But start with your, start with your own stamp and then inform yourself later with those recordings. I mean, I would be nothing without the recordings of my idols. But the, those are on the peripheral. They're there, though. Yeah. Um, Miss uh, Miss Rainbow, I think you had a question. 
Yes, thank you. Um, and before I get to my question, um, Miss Leister, um, I am from Oklahoma as well. So okay, hello. Yes, and um, I think a long time ago you were a guest soloist for my mother at Langston University. Okay. Um, Miss Professor uh, Professor Alexis Anderson Rainbow. Oh so, yes, I do remember that. Oh my yes. goodness. Yes, that yeah. was quite a my while. My mom ago. says hello. So oh. she was like, Oh my gosh, I know Marquita. Yes. Oh, thank you um, for that. Yes, yes, thank you. And thank you also, um, Professor Fernante. Um, my question is um when auditioning for a certain opera, should you choose a piece in the same era as the opera, or does that matter? Hmm. Boy, that's that's an interesting question. And you know, I, I know that one of the things that we often wonder is what should I audition with? You know, that question comes up so much. What, you know, my students say to me, well, what, what should my arias be? And I think that, I know it's gonna sound like a broken record, but I truly believe you sing the arias that you sing best. I don't think you necessarily think about era and all of that. You think, what do I sing best? I know that, there are people who feel that you should do the stair steps of opera, meaning you should sing the early music, you should sing the this, you should sing the that, you should, you should sing, Mo everybody should sing Mozart. Blah, blah. Well, I don't necessarily believe that. I think that what your voice is, is what your voice is. And we saw the wonderful maturation, for, for example, with Morala Freni, who went from this very light soprano to at the end of her career being like this full spinto type soprano. And she did those stair steps so masterfully and so gracefully that one day you just thought, oh, well, she can just sing everything. But it's how she went about doing it, okay? So I think that when you are choosing your arias, particularly at, at your age, what fits you comfortably? How, can, how does it show the strengths in that beautiful voice? And no, notice I use the word beauty. I studied with Ines Silberg at Oklahoma City University, who taught both Leona Mitchell and Chris Merritt. And she would always say to me, never louder than lovely. Never louder than <laughs> lovely. If you are pushing your voice to that edge, where it starts to get that kind of hard, squally type of thinning sound, you've gone too far. You've gone too far. You need to pull it all back. Remember to keep your voice in that beautiful, supported, buoyant place. What I mean by that buoyant place, that place where the resonance lives. And it lives freely. And then all the dynamics are not as complicated for you. Singing from piano to forte, crescendo, decrescendo, which will develop even more as you mature. You can't do it all at one time. It just comes in those steps that I was talking about and being patient with yourself, uh, just rewarding and applauding yourself for those steps that you make and understanding that singing is a process. The way you sing at 20 is not how you're going to sing at 30. It's just not the way you sing at 20 is not how you're going to sing at 22 or 23. You know, it all depends on how your voice is developing. These little things inside of here are part of this body that's growing and maturing and hormones and all of those things. And you have to constantly keep that in mind, you know? So when you're choosing your arias, just think with your teacher, notice I always say with your teacher, what is the best direction for me to go in? So I sing beautifully all the time without stress, strain or toil, but it's comfortable, it's beautiful and it's blooming. Okay. Mm. I, I agree with you so wholeheartedly. And I think it starts with knowing and loving your own personal ethics as a singer more than you love Verdi. And if you know your strengths and your ethics, you, there are just thousands of pieces that you can find that fit. And not trying to fit your voice into a piece just because you love it. Mm -hmm. And when your ethics are big, then then you can, you can do so much. I understand the, I empathize with saying, okay, I'm auditioning. They want to hear me for Serlina. Should I sing one of those two arias? Sure, maybe. Again, 
I, I trust that the people listening to me are have enough nuance in their ears to understand what you know to hear keys and hear behaviors and, and recognize that. But to really know to build your ethics and be your vocal ethics, to write them down. I know it sounds old fashioned. List the 10 best things that you do. List the 10 that you need to work on. Get more on one list than the other after time. But when your ethics are strong, you can do anything. And I, I'd like to embarrass Professor Lister for a minute. I, w I remember, I'm going to, I'm bad with remembering years, but it was the late 90s. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I saw, I saw you sing Tosca in Vancouver. Oh my goodness. With Tom Fox. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. It was so scary in that. Um, and I was just there on vacation visiting some friends and I, and I said, I'm going to see Tosca. And I, and so I saw it and I remember coming into this, I was thinking, okay, let me think of my Marquita Lister memories. Here we go. And I remember telling my friend who was, he was in the training program. He was your Spoletta that night. And um, I said, wow, she lets that high C at the end just rip when she talks about how she murdered him. But the important part of that was she also sang at the very beginning, non la sospiri la nostra casetta, this very light bouncy thing that can wear a soprano out in the first 20 minutes of the opera, right? And I was like, she's, that's two different styles right there. But the ethics were strong. It was staying within, staying on the rails, being exact, being right on the money. And I think when those rules you've set for yourself first, how can you possibly go wrong? How can you, why would you, why would you choose a piece of repertoire that doesn't show off your, your ethic, your vocally, your vocal ethics and your strengths? It would be like wearing a, a really ill-fitting outfit on the red carpet, you know? Um, again, it goes back for me, it's, this is all voluntary. You get to pick. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, when you get into opera, we, I can't speak for you, Professor Lister, but there's always a page or two in, an, in a whole opera that you're like, if that page wasn't there, this would be perfect. <laughs> always right and you know this, and then you just yeah. work hard you work hard and you pull out the technique and you do it on purpose and that's just what it is but when you can choose and it's up to you what the listener is going to hear why would you choose something that isn't showing off your strengths at all times there are plenty of choices but it starts with knowing what those strengths are and being able to articulate them and being bigger than just saying oh i have a good voice of course you have a good voice. That's why you chose this and you're going to college for it, right? Right. But be specific. And that, then those dots on the page help you how they work in your voice. That will choose your rep. Not, I love O Patria Mia, so I have to sing that. If that's, if that's not where your strengths are, maybe not a good idea. Know your strengths. But you know, I would also say about that, the FA system. I've always had a little bit of a problem with that. Because, you know, when I went to Germany... I kept thinking, I don't fit in any fa. I'm looking here, oh, the dramatic sing this, the sping toe sing that, that. I'm like, but I can sing a little bit in all of this. So it's like I refused to, to say I was a particular fa. I would say, oh, I'm just a soprano. And I just kind of left it at that. And I think it goes back to the values that you're talking about. Because to say that I sing Aida, which I sing a quite bit of, then I'm proclaiming myself to be a dramatic soprano, which I am not. Then to sing Zalome, which I did sing, I'm proclaiming myself again to be a dramatic soprano, which I'm not. So I said, I'm just going to go here. I'm just going to sing the things that make me feel comfortable. The things that I know my voice can do and do to the best of my ability. Maybe it not be to the standard of what they are looking for, for that particular fa. I mean, I'm never gonna be Hildegard Barons. You know, I'm never gonna be Resnick. I'm never gonna be the true dramatic, Dimitrova, you know, the true dramatics. You know, I'm not gonna be that, but I can certainly sing to the best of my capability. I love that Leontine Price called herself a juicy lyric soprano. <laughs> I'm a juicy lyric soprano. And that juicy lyric soprano sang across the board from Mozart to Verdi to, to whatever. So I would caution saying I'm a particular fach. I'm a soprano that loves to sing X, Y, Z. Absolutely. I hope everyone has seen, and if you haven't tried to, the, the recent documentary called The Opera House uh, about the, the history of the, the Metropolitan Opera House in Lincoln Center and uh, mm -hmm. Antine Price is featured as 
she turns into sort of a moderator of the whole documentary. But when she that being loving your own singing and your sound as Professor, your sound, that's did, right. she I mean I cracked up and where she said oh on opening night of Antony and Cleopatra she was so sensational she kissed herself. <laughs> That's definitely confidence. I mean, so, <laughs> but that's look, the number role. That's the number one rule of singing, right? You have to be confident. You have to believe you can do it. Yep. You have to have that. Without it, you are like a, out in the the ocean with in a ship with no anchor, no nothing, just mm -hmm. drifting about. Yep. Our professional athletes are great at it, and they do it for many more millions of people than we ever have, <laughs> and they 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 just do it, and we have to. We have to own it and know your strengths, articulate them, say them out loud. Every out loud. Day. Yep. That's Absolutely. right. Good. So, uh, Patrick, I think I see a note here from you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Beatty, I think, is next. And then you had you had a question from a from a viewer or a listener because we are broadcasting this live. And then we have a couple of other. I know Mr. McCarthy is uh, Mr. Manning are hanging on. So, uh, uh, Mr. Beatty, please go ahead. Hey, uh, you guys. Um, I had a question uh, concerning um, the structure of the, our repertoire list, you know, when presenting it before the panel, as far as like, would a judge or whatnot choose like a particular song off of there? Because I've had instances to where, you know, I went before in an audition to where they went from the list and just follow from, you know, one to five, or they've just been, you know, choose a particular song out of that. So what, you know, how would you suggest that, you know, we structure our repertoire list? Does it really matter how it's structured? <laughs> I mean, I think that, I'm, I'm, I think, I mean, I'm only saying that because mm -hmm. if you list your five arias, no matter what order you put them in, you usually get to choose your first piece. And then after that, it's left up to the judging panel to decide. So whether you list your, your arias in the order in which you would like to sing them, I don't think it would particularly matter. You know, that's why we've been saying you, you need to be confident in those pieces that you write down. I would not list an aria that I'm not comfortable singing. I would not list an aria that's brand new and I'm saying, oh, I'm going to try it out for the song. So no, 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 no tryout. No, no. The tryout is, is inside, you know, your, your practice room is with your coach it's in a studio class. It's something like that. The, the, the tryout is over by the time you get to an audition level. Now you are actually presenting your best, your very best. That means that if you woke up that morning and you weren't, unless, unless you have that B list that we were talking about, if this is your only list, then when I get up in the morning, I'm going to be able to 85 to 90% get through it. I can't <clears throat> because unfortunately we are human beings. And a lot of times the impression you make is the impression that's lasting, depending on who's listening to you because we're all human. There are others that are gonna say, oh, it probably wasn't such a good day. I'm not gonna penalize them for blah, blah, blah. But, you know, they're having technical problems. There's an issue with this, that you just don't know who's listening and how they're listening. So you must always, always present your best. Now, if you present your best and it's not good enough, so be it. Guess what? You get to try again another time. And it's okay, you have to forgive yourself for it and say, ah, it was a bad day. Brush it off, keep going, okay? Absolutely. I very little to add to that other than is if you are certain that everything on your list is something you would be proud of presenting on its own and only on its own to represent you, then, then it's safe that they can ask whatever they want. And you, you go and you say, I don't care which one they ask because all five show me off so well. And if you can't say that about your list, work on your list, find five pieces that satisfy that. And of course, start with that one that you're like, today, I can't leave this room without them hearing this. When you try to strategize and get into their heads, you, you won't always win. And we have to go into this knowing that every panel has a different set of tastes and needs. And sometimes it, you don't know how the person before you made them feel and what they may subconsciously be yearning for without their even knowing it. Someone just came and shrieked at them and they're looking for something mellow and that's what they're going to ask for. And they don't even know that's why they're asking for it. 
They just, they're going to use you to chill out a little bit. If one of those five pieces, any of those though, you can represent yourself well with, you will be safe. But definitely start with the one you know they need to hear. Don't say, well, they'll, I'll trick them into asking for it because sometimes they won't. Uh, Patrick, you had a question from the audience, you say? Certainly, we have a question from uh, Alexandra McKenna, and uh, they ask, what kinds of risk-taking, so this is uh, reading this verbatim, what kinds of risk-taking in theatrical movement and storytelling do you encourage young singers while presenting their repertoire? <laughs> yes. And what particular kind of setting? And, and I, I believe that, so I would be assuming that this is in the audition setting. So um, I think so. You know, so, and it's sort of like how, and if I could even, you know, kind of, I get an idea about that, you know, there are certain things that we do in performance, and then there are certain things that we do in an audition. And so, but you're still trying to, uh, trying to give the characters and try to speak to this and speak to that. How far do you go? Like, you know, in Tosca, when you, by the time you're like bringing up Tosca, by the time you sing Viti Darte or you're singing uh, 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 Soir, singing the final aria, you know, usually on the floor. Now, do you present that like that in an audition? Like, you know, so those are the, I guess that would be some of that question. Well, I did see such a thing in an audition and it was a bit alarming. It was, um, I have to say. <laughs> this woman in this beautiful gown and she stands there she announced it and then she drops to her knees I'm like oh my is she okay you know because I mean the first thing I thought oh she doesn't feel well oh poor thing but she was really preparing the moment you know in her mind she was being true and authentic to the moment for me it was a bit much it was a bit much given it was an audition setting so I think that it's finding a way to still be in that moment, but still be standing. That's that's my opinion. What do you think, Professor? Um, first, when you the the word that triggered me in a good way is about risk, mm -hmm. and be, be able to calculate in advance what the the positives out, positive outcomes of that risk could be, and what the negatives could be, and could you live with the negative? So I've definitely seen some crazy things. I have seen a Liu throw herself on the ground after two Katie Joe. And when you're in a slave girl's robes and you throw yourself on the ground, that looks good. When you're in Mark Jacobs, it doesn't always. So that's something to consider. But I've heard one of my favorite stories was from a very well-known opera company chorus audition where a gentleman came in and sang Papageno's first aria. And at the end of the, the intro did a backflip. Oh, and the pianist could barely get through the rest from, from laughing, right? Mm -hmm. So know what the potential risks are and know what the most negative outcome could be. And then you ask yourself, could you live with it? Because there's a chance that that could happen. And if you couldn't live with it, maybe it's not a good risk. And then click, the, click your thought process to the left a little bit till you get to a risk that you could live if it weren't received perfectly well. Or at all. At all, exactly. At all. <laughs> I would consider, now, um, you know, we have one of our finest directors moderating this room right now, but I would consider sometimes exploring the power of maintaining focus sometimes and, and something as simple as not looking away in an interlude in an aria. Right. How, how strong that can be. Oh. I work with that with singers a, a lot. Say, so, okay, you have a six measures of interlude. Interlo I was working with someone on Pace Pace. E pace, pace, dio, pace, dio, bring, and the harp's playing in this interlude. And the same focus, never dropping it. And then starting singing in that same focus. The person watching was afraid to look away. <laughs> and sometimes that's more powerful than doing a cartwheel. But, you know, how about the concept of drawing us in? Yes. Drawing us in, having us so compelled by you that we're just with bated breath. And sometimes you can do that with just the simple hand movement. Like you said, that very strong focus, that very sense of what the character is is you are that person. You're not a character, you are now this person. And it is so captivating that there's no need for a lot of movement. As a matter of fact, the least little movement is going to make us 
follow it because you are so focused. And there is some real mastery in that. There really is. Sometimes less is more. Sometimes there's a lot of noise and quiet, you know, and it's just really understanding when to, to bring that into play. Absolutely. So, you know, better than flailing yourself all around because we get nervous for you. It makes me nervous. I gotta be honest with you. It really does. So I think that that very, that focused, but I'm not saying standard like a statue, but have your movement have meaning. I think that's really what I'm trying to say. Have the movement mean something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say that, Pair Director? Yes. <laughs> I, yes, I would definitely yes. say that. <laughs> okay. For sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you both for that. Uh, we have uh, Mr. McCarthy, and then followed by Mr. McCarthy will be Mr. Manning. Hello again. Hi. I wanted to ask if you're looking to challenge yourself in your repertoire and switch out song, new songs, what, compose, new, what new composers or new arias do you look for and challenge yourself for giving yourself that extra push? Well, that's a very interesting question for me because first of all, I'm a very big advocate of African-American composers. I think it's really important to be supportive of African-American composers, not to mention the fact that the operatic works that have been written by, by um, African-American composers are really quite stunning. They really are. They are far more beautiful than you can, than you even know. You know, I, I, I'm ashamed to say that most of my career when I would do recitals, I really didn't know any African-American composers. I knew that gray book that was written by Willis Patterson, but I didn't know anything else. And it wasn't until I became really close friends with Louise Toppin and got to know Daryl Taylor, who runs the Art Song Alliance out in California, that this whole world opened to me in terms of repertoire. And I have fallen in love and have been on that bandwagon ever since because the music is so stunning not just in musical texture, but in actual text. The poetry is magnificent, okay? So when I'm looking, speaking now to you just about operas, okay? You look at people like William Banfield, Lulia, you know, Leslie Adams with Blake. You have Anthony Davis with The Life of Malcolm X, Under the Double Moon, Tanya, Amistad, Wakanda's Dream, Lilith. Okay, you have Joseph Boulange, who's known as Chevalier de Saint-Georges for his piece, Ernestine, okay? You can have William Grant Still, who wrote Blue Steel, Trouble Island, A Bayou Legend, Costazzo, Mota, The Pillar, Minette Fontaine, Highway One, USA, which is a fantastic piece. Richard Thompson wrote The Mask. You have Stephen Allen, who wrote Lyrics of Sunshine and Shadows and a shorter piece called The Poet. There's Antonio Carlos Gomez, who is an Afro-Brazilian composer, who wrote several operas, but one of the most popular one to extract arias from is Fosca, is Fosca, which is in Italian, but the music reminds you so much of Puccini. It really does, you know? So again, it goes back to, we're circling right back to where we before in doing the investigative work looking outside of the comfort zone because yes opera companies they're doing the standard opera but out of curiosity i went on the wolf trap site because i was curious about what they're listening for in their auditions and it's the standard Robert's repertoire di Zauberflöte, le Note di figaro you know but they also throw in there our town susanna some newer pieces, you know, uh, which was the one that I saw that I thought was particularly interesting that I had never heard of. I mean, there is a plethora of new pieces coming out. I mean, a plethora of them. Some, some of them are full operas and some of them are one act operas. And it's certainly worth, you know, enhancing your education by listening to them. Sometimes I just listen to be listening because I just find it all so curious. For example, Nashville Opera just did a new piece that's wonderful, One Vote One. Mm -hmm. It's a very simple piece, but it's so poignant to the time. And so listen to these kinds of things for the style, for actually the, the 
the integration of styles because there's, you know, there's the classical and you hear a little bit of a, a little sprinkling of a little hip hop, a little this, a little that, you know, it's making opera more relevant because there are people who say, oh, I don't like opera. Well, how do you know if you haven't listened to it? How do you know if you're not listening to all the different type of opera that there is now? There's not just the standards, Aida, Carmen, Barbara Seville. There's mm -hmm. not, there's so much more now, you know, that really mm -hmm. draw you in. So I would say to you, there is this book for the young singers. It's called um, an Opera Anthology, Boozy and Hawks. And it has a lot of the American composers in it in terms of arias that you can choose from. Okay, there's this. There is another book that is called American Aria. Okay, it looks just like this. You can purchase it. It has all kinds of uh, American composers in it and some of the newer pieces that are out there that you can add to your plethora of arias. I think it's good for your education. Cl classical vocal reprints. It has songs and arias. Uh, Leslie Adams' opera, Blake, Lyrics of Sunshine and Shadows, the same thing with Stephen Allen. So the repertoire is out there. William Grant still, right here. He also has anthologies that are for soprano, mezzo, bass, baritone, that list arias and duets from his different works. So invest in it. Invest in it. Bring a wider spectrum to that aria list that we've been talking about. You know, I think people are always interested to hear new works. I certainly am. When I'm sitting on a judic uh, adjudicating board, I'm like, oh, let's see what it is. Oh, another Aki's views. Let mm -hmm. me hear something else. You know, I mean, I'm being very serious now. I think it's a beautiful piece for you, but now bring something else to it. You know, kind of in your, for your um, English piece, you don't have to just sing in terms of an African-American piece, something from Porgy and Bass. You know, there are other pieces to choose from. You don't have to sing just Summertime. You don't have to just sing My Man's Gone Now. There are other choices. And I'm just saying, invest in it. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. And um, Professor Lister has used the word invest, <laughs> and which is the same prefix in the word investigation, which seems to be our, our theme today. It, it requires you to to demand to, to demand the most of yourself in and in, in, in how you research and what you're researching there are so many websites that can help you get the ball rolling you know whether you're thinking of um sphinxmusic.org or composerdiversity.com those are great starting points listen we are at we are all alive at an exciting time for for good and bad reasons right um, go look at the, the websites of 30 American opera companies, and I dare you to see how many aren't expressing initiatives to build on our current deficiencies and our repertoire knowledge. You know, when, when, if we're talking specifically about Black composers, rolling forward in this vehicle, we are looking to to encourage new composers to write and have current living composers write. And in the rearview mirror, we have great composers, Florence Price, Scott Joplin, right? Make sure you keep an eye on the rearview mirror as well, because these are still pieces that need to be amplified. Because in that rearview mirror is also our, the, the, the cold-hearted truths of our American history. And there's a reason we don't know enough. There is an absolute reason. And it is up to you now as students in 2020 to say that is not how we do things anymore, right? And it is, it, is, it is imperative that you know everything that has come before you as much as what's about to come. And if you look, I mean, find, I dare you, reach out to, listen, today's young up and coming composers are eager to talk about their inspirations. You have yeah. social media, turn it into something good. Damien Sneed, who is one of the best up and coming pianists and composers we have out there. And he's, you know, on staff now at Houston Grand Opera. He, he wrote the, the piece Spiritual Sketches for, for Larry Brownlee. If you haven't heard the recording, you should. Um, I guarantee you these artists want to tell you about their inspirations. Be gutsy, ask people, 
you know, find out. But please, I, I can't, I say this all the time, keep a respectful eye on the rear view mirror too, so that you know what our, our deficiencies have been so that they don't repeat themselves. That's so important to me. And COVID will not be here forever. Correct. And when COVID is gone, then as we progress forward, the people who will, who will progress faster, in my opinion, are the ones who've taken this time to make a plan for themselves, mm -hmm. to make a plan, to say, I'm using this, this pause button in history, because it's just a pause button, soon that's going to be lifted, to say, I'm going to educate mm -hmm. myself in this, that, and the other. And I'm going to listen to this, that, and the other. And I'm going to be, could become good at this, that, and the other. I'm going to become a little more proficient in my Italian, a little more proficient in my German, a little bit more proficient in my French. I'm going to make sure that I have a full knowledge of what is relevant now in terms of opera and art song. And I want to be a part of that. I want to, I want to have an open palette, so to speak, so that my taste buds are not just for food that's familiar, but food that maybe is not so familiar. So that I then have a seat at many different tables, not just one table. And I think it's very important to understand that that idea of diversity, that idea of things that are different are, it's so important. It really is. When I was coming along, opera was different. It was very different. You know, you, you sang certain, things certain ways you know it was just the tradition quote unquote it was the tradition now we still have some of those traditions but we also think outside of the box in a different kind of way you know and so it's a different world i saw opera in a different world when i went to germany you know i worked a lot with gertz friedrich and harry kupfer who did these conceptual operas that were crazy I mean, wind up toys all over the floor and people coming out of gift boxes and everything sprayed blue. So you didn't know what was what, but for some reason it meant something, you know, pl potted plants that, that, you know, meant one thing and no plants meant something else. It was thinking out of the box. You know what I'm talking about? You know, um, it's just like what it meant everything, but yet meant nothing. And we had to make sense of it all. It was a different kind of thinking process. So you could still deliver an interesting character, but yet stay true to the writing of the music because the writing of the music is not going to change. It is what it is. And it's like melding the two worlds together. And sometimes it worked beautifully and sometimes it didn't, you know, but it stretched your artistry. So I'm saying stretch your artistry. Don't be afraid to do that, but you can't do that without these fundamentals that we're talking about first, particularly as young singers, and that's understanding the fundamentals of singing first, understanding how important the vocalizations are, understanding how important it is to know how the vowels fit within your voice, understanding how to pronounce clearly, to enunciate clearly because we want to understand your words, no matter what language that they're in, particularly though in English, if you're singing of any of the English pieces, so that we can clearly see where you're trying to go, understanding your characters, understanding how you fit into that, you know? It's, it's, a, it's a process, that's all I can say, but it's such a beautiful, wonderful process. And right now the world is so open, it's so open. Take it and run. That's what I say. Take it and run. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, we, we have time for maybe uh, one question. We're about five minutes or so. I believe Mr. Manning is next. Patrick, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Mr. Manning, please. Hi, hello. Um, I just had, you know, one question about uh, repertoire. I wanted to ask, um, uh, based on, you know, like, you know, how, how, what are your thoughts on adding like theater repertoire to like audition lists? What do you think, Jason? Um, know who you're singing for. <laughs> if, you're, if you're singing for a place that uh, you're talking about singing musical theater, um, if, if you're singing for a place that, that has a history of, of doing works like that, and, and you and again, it shows off all of your strengths that, that you've already I, articulated for yourself that you know. I'm a big fan of it personally. Um, 
that 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 I mean, that's just a personal take. I think you'll you, there are definitely a, at least one American opera company that articulates in their in their application process, don't sing this composer, don't sing musical theater, and at least you know going into it. I find while it may come off as as aggressive, I find it helpful because I've ticked off potential mistakes. That's great for me. Um, but yeah, I'm all for it. Absolutely, if it shows off your strengths, the the the, the golden spots of your of your registrations, your con the expressivity that you connect to, absolutely, why not? And that's that's. That's a good question to start with is why not? And if there are a lot of answers to that, then maybe don't do it. <laughs> I mean, but you also find that there are opera houses that will accept things from street scene. Yeah. They'll, they'll accept things from Candide, yep. you know, which kind of are, you know, people don't think of it necessarily as an opera, but you know, the music is kind of classical in its its makeup. So you, you hear Glitter and Be Gay or, you'll hear, you know, Lonely House or something along that line. You Sometimes you'll hear those things. But once again, I think that what Professor Ferrante is saying is true, is just know who you're singing for. You know, I wouldn't just automatically assume. I wouldn't do that. Yes. So, so that you're not penalized for it. For sure. Well, wow. Thank you both so much for being a part of this. Uh, please join me in thanking um, Marquita Lister and Jason Ferrante for being with us today. Uh, and Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, so I do wanna really quickly uh, thank our sponsors again. Uh, this is made possible by the National Endowment of the Arts, Opera America Innovations Grant, and the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, South Arts, the Andrew and W. Mellon Foundation. And they are our sponsors, and we really appreciate them helping us to make this happen. I want to once again thank you, Marquis Lister, for being here, and Jason for much. This has been terrific. We will have another masterclass in, this, in uh, November, and that masterclass is going to be with um, a, a manager, Ana de Archuleta, and uh, Wayne Brown, who is the general director of Michigan Opera Theater. And the discussion at that will be careers or career possibilities outside of performance. If for some reason you want to go into administration in an opera company or education director, we're gonna be discussing that and the roads of how to get there if that's something that you wanna look at in the future. So uh, uh, thank you again to everybody and we will see you in November. Thank you. Thank you, right. bye. bye. Thank you. This time. I'll vote. It starts with.